Welcome to Renee Marie's Stroke of Luck. I'm Renee Marie, and this is going to be an awesome, very informative show, and it really is very personal to us. Um, as both m many of you know that follow us, sorry about that, that's my <laughs> phone. Uh, we always have phones on. Um, but as many of you know, we just had a Ginny Warner um, join our board foundation. Oh, why is, you know what? That's going to be a pain today. You know, because my uh, AOL, it, it, every time it gets an email, I get that. So I'm going to have to figure out what to do. Uh, but that's okay. So back to what the important stuff is. Um, just recently on our telethon, we announced that Ginny Warner was going to be a part of our board. So this is very personal. This is Ginny's story as to um, how her stroke happened and, 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 the, and the recovery afterwards. And we actually have her doctor here, the neurologist, on Dr. Libman, um, is here to talk to us about her journey and really for acute stroke recovery. It really is important to, to, to understand that. Um, before I continue to talk, because I can do that forever, um, let me introduce um, to the my far right is <laughs> Judy, uh, Judy Marlowe. No political she, intent. Uh, no, <laughs> <laughs> is the, uh, my co-host today. So hi, Judy. Hi, how are you? How are you? Good, hi. good. Good to good. see you again, Judy. And to my right, my near right is uh, Ginny Warner, the um, the new board member of our foundation. Who today it's really her story. Um, you know, most of you have heard mine over and over and over again, and Judy's over and over and over again. Um, and we want you to hear it over and over again because that just reminds you that how important um, it is to uh, to prevent a stroke. Because once again, we're going to say. 80% of strokes can be prevented, um, and 80% of strokes can be prevented. Um, also, if you catch it within a four and a half hour window, um, it's really important. Those are important facts that we're gonna keep saying to a blue in the face, because it really is just becoming to the mainstream of society how important strokes are. And what, what, what I think makes strokes very interesting is each in each case is so individual and and that's why people really don't take I'm not gonna say importance but they don't take notice so much of it because each case is so individual that it's like a stroke what is a stroke how do we get a stroke like so those are the things we're gonna talk to Ginny's doctor about today and thank you so much for inviting your doctor to be on our today's <laughs> show. <laughs> oh, thank you. It's, it's a pleasure to be here, and I'm really happy that Dr. Libman uh, could be here with us. Um, he has been my neurologist for 10 years. Uh, I had my stroke uh, just over 10 years ago, and I came to Dr. Libman through a, a very highly recommended from my internist. 
So uh, we'll we'll talk about uh, how that all came about. Wow, that's good. You know, and and we want to reiterate all the time to everybody is, you know, if you see somebody having the signs of a stroke, and the signs of a stroke are fast. It's very simple to remember. Fast. We all live fast-paced lives. So fast should be a really simple. Um, analogy to remember and fast is the face if you see someone's face that is not um, uh, even you know that that one side is drooping that could be a sign the arms um, where you put the arms out and one arm is kind of falling to the to the to the to the lower right it, like mm-hmm. this could you put the doctor on Jim uh, Jim because I, I yeah does generally doctor, you just ask you know what ask start the person th- to do this you yeah, start from the beginning about so fast, face face because it's just such a common thing and many people will associate changes in the face with a stroke Um, not that every time your face changes it is a stroke but it might be and what most people will describe is some kind of twisting of the face you look at the person ask them to smile and you see something like this and I'm exaggerating it so it doesn't which is the way I smile and it doesn't have to be that prominent but you'll see one side sort of sagging One side going up, that's the normal side, because that's how you smile. Right. And here's a side that's drooping down. If you see any significant sudden asymmetry, that and it comes on suddenly, that could definitely be a sign of a of a stroke. Right. And when you say fast, the other component is the A, the arms. And um, for that, if you just can remember, you ask the person, just hold out your arms like this. And the arms are so commonly affected by stroke that what you'll tend to see is they hold out the arms and you'll just see one starting to drift down. Right. Now, of course, if they've developed sudden real paralysis, they're not going to be able to do it at all, right. which is just as significant. If you say raise right. your arms and they go like this and they're struggling right. with the other one, that's just as significant. But very often, if it's not that severe, you'll see them go like this and then you'll see one start to drift down. Right. And that's the arm. And then the S stands for speech. And we're talking about basically any speech disturbance. So you just talk to them. You say, well, what's wrong? You know, what are you feeling? And they could be suddenly slurring. They could be slurring their speech like that. Or they could be virtually unable to generate speech. And they'll just, uh, I, uh, uh, I, I, I think... Uh, uh, they can't think, they can't process They cannot thing. generate the words, or they can't change their thoughts into words, and you'll hear that hesitant, difficult, frustrated speech. Right. And at other times, a variation of that would be that they don't really have difficulty generating speech, and they'll come up with a whole slew of words the way we're talking, but it won't make any sense. Right. And right. they'll be using the wrong words, and instead of saying car, they'll say building. Right. Instead mm-hmm. of right. saying desk, they'll say chair. Right. Something right. like that. Which is a form of aphasia. Those are all forms of aphasia. Right. And the point of the FAST test, when it comes to speech, is it's any speech, any speech disturbance, right. anything that goes wrong with speech. Again, if it comes on suddenly, it's very likely that it's going to be a stroke. Right. And then the T, of course, is time. And you mentioned four and a half hours, and I would like to elaborate that on Absolutely. that a little bit Absolutely. in a couple of minutes. Okay. But just to remember that time is absolutely crucial. Because, because, you, a, because a stroke is a brain attack. A stroke is a brain attack analogous to a heart attack. It's basically brain cells dying. And the calculation is what's been sort of calculated based on experiments and things like that is when you get blockage in a blood vessel to the brain, you are losing close to 2 million brain cells per minute. 2 million brain cells per minute. Now you have a lot of brain cells, but still, (laughs) 2 million brain cells per minute, that's part of time. And the other way of looking at it is when you have a blockage to the brain, the amount of damage that occurs to the brain in one hour is equivalent to 10 years of aging. Wow, say that again. Years, Re- speak the, speak amount, that, that's important. the amount of brain damage that occurs to the brain in the setting of a stroke, you've blocked the blood vessel, the amount of brain damage that occurs in one hour is equivalent to what happens to our brains in 10 years of normal aging. And you can imagine what happens to a 60-year-old brain, to a 70-year-old brain, a 70-year-old brain, to an 80-year-old brain, whatever it is, we all know, for better or for worse, there are differences in that person. And um, so time is always crucial. 
Always, always, always. And I'll just elaborate a little bit on the FAST, F-A-S-T, face, arm, speech, time. Before you do though, I want to add something that I think is very important. You'll agree with me once you hear it is, if you do see somebody, and this is one of our biggest things, if you do see somebody possibly having a stroke and you call 911, yes. you are to tell that, that um, EMS, dispatcher, EMS, whoever it is. Dispatcher, that's the word. Dispatcher, that it could possibly have a stroke because they'll go into stroke mode, which yes. means that when the do the ambulance get there, they'll know kind of what to look for. And if they determine it, you'll they'll when on the way to the hospital, they'll pass triage once they get to the hospital and they'll go right in for a CAT scan because time is of the essence. Not only that, uh, when they think it's a stroke, now it's a very high level for EMS. Yeah. It's sort of the equivalent yes. virtually of a cardiac arrest, right. almost right. like a right. cardiac arrest. Right. So that's lights and sirens. Right. And they also know, and EMS is trained, not all hospitals are stroke That's centers. True, yeah. I know. So they will know Which to bypass yeah. even a slightly closer hospital because if they don't have the resources to treat you the way they have to, they'll bypass that closer hospital but get you quickly to a designated stroke center, yeah. which is which See, is I imperative. didn't know that, doctor. Mm -hmm. I yeah. thought they just had to take you to the nearest hospital and then it was the family that had to get you to the stroke center. They will not. They are trained, and it's been like this for many years, since hospitals in New York State were designated, first by the New York State Department of Health, and then there's uh, other national organizations that designate hospitals as stroke centers, things called the Joint Commission. These are like organizations that are really there to assure quality of care. These hospitals have to show that they can take a stroke patient within minutes, get a CAT scan, within minutes, get other appropriate testing, within minutes, get treatment started, for example, with right. clot busting drugs right. and things right. like that. Right. But I did want to, I know you have lots of other questions. No, but no, 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 I, I, just, I, I just wanted to add that in because so it stayed in alignment with the timing of it. But what's yes, really right. important for the FAST, for the FAST FAST, there's a little bit more, which the hospitals have now incorporated, and it's now called BE-FAST. Oh, okay. B-E-FAST, and it's easy to remember, but it captures a lot more people who are having strokes. It's a little more sensitive. The B is for balance, because many people, when they have a stroke, will suddenly lose balance. Mm -hmm. Whether or not they're losing strength and they're getting paralyzed on one side, sometimes all it is, is sometimes they're staggering as if they're drunk, mm -hmm. they have not been drinking, and they're suddenly staggering from side to side. Balance is right. a very, very common. The thing is, it can, it's notorious because people miss it, and they say, oh, maybe you just have an inner ear problem. Mm -hmm. Maybe you just developed some vertigo. You know, we'll put you in the back of the emergency room, we'll get to you later, because it's just some, it's an inner ear problem, we'll give you some medicine, uh, don't worry about it. But sudden loss of balance is a biggie, in big symptom in terms of signs of stroke, and the other E is um, B fast uh, eyes, um, because another common symptom in stroke is a sudden change in vision. Wow. A sudden change in vision. It could be a sudden loss of vision off to one side. It could be sudden blindness in one eye, wow. or fairly commonly, it's actually double vision. So the person suddenly says, "You know, I'm, I'm looking at this person, and suddenly I saw two of him. I look at the clock, and I see two clocks." Um, any change in vision that is sudden. Mm -hmm. But you know what, you know what's very important, and this is why we keep doing this show and keep bringing it, it's important that we all are aware of the signs. Because, yes. because the person that's suffering it doesn't know that they could be suffering a stroke. That, yes. that, that those around us need to be aware that it, it may be nothing, it may be nothing, but you need to call 911 immediately. You absolutely need to call 911. And what makes stroke so horrific in a sense and so notorious compared to, let's say, a heart attack. I mean, a heart attack's a bad thing to have. Nobody's gonna deny that. But when you have crushing chest pain or you can't breathe because you're short of breath, you're nauseated, you feels like an elephant is sitting on your chest, most people don't say, you know, I'll sleep it off, uh, right. you know, I'll wait till right. the morning. Right. The trouble with stroke, okay, you have, a, you have some numbness on one side, you have weakness on one side, you're staggering, you're slurring your speech, you're not able to understand what other people are saying, you're not making sense. Um, some people will say, I mean, unless you're totally paralyzed, but sometimes even then, they say, you know what? There's no pain involved. I'm not uncomfortable. I'm not short of breath. 
I don't think I'm about to die. I think what I'll do is evening time, let me go to sleep or take a nap. Worst thing and, they can do. And, mm -hmm. and when I wake up, maybe it'll be better. It is 100% the worst thing you can do right. because those precious moments go back to the two million brain cells mm -hmm. a minute or the hour long blockage equivalent to 10 years of aging, you are sitting there and then you've maybe lost your window of opportunity right. for treatment. Right. And the other thing is to know, so you may suddenly lose your speech, even if you wanted to call 911, you can't communicate, yeah. or there's a whole series of strokes, probably about 40% of all strokes, when they occur on the right side of the brain, as opposed to the left, okay, left side of the brain, language, many people know. Left side of the brain, language, lose your language, paralyzed on the right side. Right side of the brain, your language may be totally fine. You may become weak on the other side, the left side. The thing about the right side of the brain is it controls your awareness oh. of problems happening to you. Wow. So you can become completely paralyzed, crash to the floor, can't walk, can't lift your arm, ask the person if anything's wrong, they'll say, I'm totally okay. fine. And you say, well, 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 but you just crashed to the <laughs> floor. What? Right. No, no, I uh, just tripped. tripped. Well, um, can you raise your left arm? Uh, yeah. Well, I would say, well, are you raising it normally now? Yes. Yeah, because the, they, don't know, they don't process or understand. They have no awareness wow. or ability to recognize wow. that something's wrong. So imagine if they're alone, they eat, you can tell them till you're blue in the face, call 911 if you have a problem, unless you have an onlooker, family, friend, right, right. witness, someone right. in society. That's walking, exactly what happened won't. to my dad. Yeah. They don't know, and that's what makes it even worse. He was alone worse. when it happened. You're wow. alone. You know, if you're alone, unfortunately, I, again, you can lose your speech or you can lose your awareness. Wow. And mm. that's a bad situation. Wow, that's incredible. It's incredible. And. Let, let me formally introduce you. <laughs> we, are, we were so excited. Actually, I just wandered in here. <laughs> no, no, no. But, uh, but that just shows you, without me saying anything, how passionate Dr. Lib Libman. 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 Yeah. I got to keep asking him. I'll make sure they're okay. saying his name correctly. Just think but of the doc mop. The doctor is about bringing awareness to everybody. Mm -hmm. You know, you could tell because he was just like jumped in and he really wanted to get involved. I'm like, okay, open the camera up. We're gonna <laughs> we're gonna invite him. I'm so, interviewing you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um. But thank you for coming today. It's a Sunday thank morning. You. Thank you for you having me. You and your, your wife are here, and um, I hope you have a wonderful day plans. But this is really important to us thank to you. bring awareness to the, to the world on strokes, you know. And um, so give, give us a little bit um, a background about yourself so that um, Ginny had shared with us. But give us a little bit of background on yourself, please. Well, I, I'll start, I, I won't go too far back to when I was five years old, but let me start with what's probably more relevant. Um, I, uh, I, uh, I went to McGill University in Montreal. As an undergraduate, I studied uh, psychology. Wow. And uh, I stayed at McGill, went into medical school at McGill. And um, when I did my uh, residency in neurology, I came to New York and went to the Albert Einstein College of Medicine. Wow. And that was another three years after an internship, so it was four years after medical school. Um, I then did three years of dedicated uh, training in stroke at Columbia Presbyterian Hospital. Wow. So that was another three years of purely stroke. And why did you decide to get into that like what was what was the inkling and first of all you know now that you study psychology it's an important yep. piece of the puzzle that I don't know about other doctors but it really adds to your credibility because when you suffer a stroke it's the mind so you're understanding the mind even before you're getting into the stroke world I mean I would like to think so but without uh, without sort of exaggerating that too much. I mean, psychology is a fascinating field and it does kind of lend itself to go into medicine. It really does. But so do a lot of areas of science. And many of my colleagues, you know, did different, uh, major, you know, in different scientific right, right. Absolutely. disciplines, biology Absolutely. and others. But, um, but yes, I was fascinated in the, in the brain and the mind from fairly early on. So that's why I did psychology. Right. And then I realized I wanted to become a doctor. I wasn't entirely sure what area of medicine right. but you know as a medical student you sort of bounce from area to area <laughs> and you get exposure to everything right. and once I um, did a month in neurology I knew that was it for me now I can't uh, pretend that another f 
aspect had nothing to do with it, and that was that my father was a neurologist. Oh, my okay. father had worked in neurology for many, many years. It was very superb neurologist, so that wow. probably had some some influence. And then I, as, as you go into neurology, of course, there are so many fields of neurology. Everybody knows, right? There's epilepsy, there's Parkinson's disease, right, right. there's back pain, there's dizziness, right. there's all kinds of different areas of neurology. And one day when I was a resident, we had a famous speaker come to talk to, the, to our department about stroke. And uh, I was sitting there, I really knew very little about it. I was just a resident, you know, still training. And he came in and he said, uh, you know, this person suddenly becomes paralyzed and this person suddenly loses their speech. They go to the emergency department. What do you do? First thing you have to do is figure out what's wrong. Right. What's wrong? Right. Because right. the reality is it may look like a stroke and it may well be a stroke, but some of those patients end up having bleeding in their brain. Right. Some of those patients end up having a brain tumor. Right. Some right. of those patients end up having low blood sugar. Right. Right. And some of those patients have multiple sclerosis, right. et cetera, et cetera. And he st Diagnosis. stood there, this famous stroke neurologist, and it all sort of came together. I sat there, it was a big black box to me. I had right. no idea. So a stroke is a stroke. Perhaps I'll learn about it someday. And this one speaker in right. one hour put everything together and he called it, what's wrong with Mr. Jones? Mr. Right. Jones comes in and he suddenly lost his speech and he's paralyzed on one side, but what's actually wrong with him? Right. And right. for that, you had to do the appropriate tests. Don't assume that it's a stroke and suddenly jam blood thinning medication into him when in fact, he has a brain tumor. Right. You're not going to help him. You're going to hurt him. Right. And right. Uh, he put it in perspective. And I fell in love with, you know, if, in so far as you could sort of fall in love with yes. the discipline. Yes. yes. It's depressing. And at the same time, it's optimistic. And I fell in love with the whole field of stroke thinking, A, we can understand it. And it was just around a turning point around the 19, late 1980s and early 1990s was this major turning point where stroke transformed from a field where you basically did nothing. Right. The patient came in, get flowers, and send them to physical therapy. Oh there was God. nothing else to yeah. do, no <laughs> effective treatments. And just as I was finishing my training and in the middle of my training, uh, the first clot busting drug came around, wow. which is called TPA, yeah. which is what you're referring to when you set a four and a half hour window. It used to be a three hour window. Well, I went straight from my training to Long Island Jewish Medical Center, Long Island Jewish Hospital, which was the leading center in the country wow. testing TPA. It that uh, clot busting drug, it took over five years. And we took, as the patients were coming into the hospital, we rushed in 24 seven, often in the middle of the night, three hour time window, which is why I lived eight minutes away from the hospital <laughs> right. and why I right. moved there in the first place. Right. And LIJ, and of course it was going on across the country, but we were the leading center. And after several hundred patients and five years of work, we basically sat there, we had no idea what happened because as investigators testing a new drug, we were blinded, what's called blinding. It was the drug being tested against the placebo, basically mm -hmm. a, a, a salt or a sugar solution yeah. going into the patient in an IV, same way as the clot busting drug. We didn't know. We worked and worked and worked. And after five years, we got together at the NIH, which sponsored it, the National Institutes of Health. It was a government sponsored study, wow. not a drug come, you know, it was not a pharmaceutical study. It was a government sponsored study. Of this, may, which to me makes it more credible. And that's what we all yeah. like to believe. From the drug that's company. what we yeah. all like but, to believe. Yeah. And we sat there and the statisticians got up who had been analyzing this because we had no idea. After five years of work, 24 seven, I was on call every second night for five years because there were only two of us. So we just <laughs> alternated, so we right. alternated the right. nights. Right. And uh, the statisticians stood up and said, we have a positive trial. And a positive trial meant that we had the first proven effective medication for stroke wow. ever invented. Wow. There was nothing to do for these patients until, yeah. and we stood up as doctors, it never happens, never happens. The doctors all stood up and started to clap. Doctors <laughs> yeah. don't clap. Like doctors don't get excited wanna, about these yeah. things. I just want to know, doctor, at what point did they point out to all the neurosurgeons that were giving the drug that you can't give it to someone who's had a, uh, 
bleed or something or else. Or a, hemor yeah. Yeah, a hemorrhagic stroke. A hemorrhagic stroke, which is the opposite. It's like the flip side of a coin, and we didn't go into it. But of course, the, the majority of strokes are due to blockage. The majority of strokes are due to blockage in the brain. The minority, maybe 15% roughly, are bleeding, bleeding types of stroke. So 85%, if you just had to guess, patient comes in, if you just had to guess, it's probably going to be a blockage type of stroke for which we now have treatment. Yes. Um, the bleeding types of strokes are a minority, but they are devastating, of course. They are devastating. And uh, we have made, I hate to say it, in certain ways, pathetically less progress in bleeding types of strokes. But your question was, what do we do? You obviously can't give a clot busting drug to a bleeding type of stroke. Now this of course was built into the study. When we're doing the study of TPA, okay. everybody, the first thing that happens is everybody gets a CAT scan. And the CAT scan is incredibly sensitive for, for uh, bleeding. So the first thing everybody gets is a CAT scan. If there's one ounce of blood in the brain, they're out because one ounce of blood in the brain can become a liter, you know, a quart of wow. blood in the brain if you give them a clot-busting drug. So that is the first screening test. Everybody gets a CAT scan. You can get an MRI if it's available, but CAT scan is usually more available. You get it and then you know, are they eligible okay. for a clot-busting drug or are they not? And um, TPA revolutionized treatment. Remember, it was first three hours. We didn't know that we could stretch it any further. All the studies and the big study that we were involved with used this very tight three hour window, which is why we go around and we talk to people. We give these public education talks. We go to nursing homes. We go to various community centers, synagogues, temple, uh, churches. Right. Right. We'd go everywhere and try to tell the public exactly what you were saying before. You recognize any of those signs? Call 911. Right. And Within a few years, about 10 years it took actually, another study took place. What year was that that it came out? The year we finished the study was 1995. 1995. And it was published that same year in the New England Journal of Medicine. And in 1996, the drug was approved. By the way, the fastest approval of wow. any drug wow. in FDA history wow. because you were taking an untreatable disease and making it treatable. Yeah. There yeah. was no treatment. Yeah. And the FDA recognized that. It, it took them a year, which still seems like a You know, strokes, you know, it, it, it's the first leading cause of disability in the, in the country, right? Not in the world, in the country? In the Western world. In the Western all world. All developed oh countries, it is the leading cause of adult disability. Mm -hmm. The leading cause of adult disability. It's like way up there in terms of death, but it's not the leading cause of it's death because it's cancer and heart attack, yeah, 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 and lung disease. Yeah. Um, it, it dropped as the cause of death because of the progress right. that we made. Right. So it used right. to be like three, then right. it became four, and right. now it's fifth right. cause of death. Unfortunately, it is the leading cause of disability, yes. which means that you need to get to the hospital quickly because by getting treated, you dramatically decrease the chances of being disabled dramatic and and the, and how you're disabled i mean the the longer you don't go to the hospital the the more severe your disablement will be that is absolutely right and if you delay you could go if you're not treated you end up paralyzed you may make some improvement of course people do make improvement over time after stroke it does happen frequently right but you could remain in a wheelchair instead of being able to walk. Right. Or you right. could use a walker instead of being able to walk right. by yourself. Right. Or you need a nursing home instead of living independently, which of course is the major factor. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. want to be able to live independently. TPA, which is the clot busting drug, dramatically reduces disability. Right. And it takes a fairly large proportion of people from dressing yourself yes. or maybe climbing yes. a flight of stairs you suddenly can't do by yourself anymore. Mm -hmm. TPA takes a fair number of those people and shifts them into being independent. Mm -hmm. And imagine the difference to the person, let alone society, if you don't have to take these people and put them in a nursing home. The difference for the family, the difference for the person who's had the stroke, and then look at it out of the whole society and the amount of money that we have to spend as a society Where's the money going? If they're all going to nursing homes, you have that much money less 
how about all the people who need dialysis? I mean, I'm just yeah, giving right, an example. Right, There's right, only right, so right, much right, to go around. Right, right. Um, take all those people who would have gone to nursing homes and keep them in their home, independent. Yes. It makes a dramatic difference. Yes, yes. I have a question for you. When you go to give the TPA, do you need to get insurance approval? Absolutely not. It's like any other emergency uh, treatment. I mean, you come well, to the emergency that's, room. That's good to hear. You need a, no, 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 no. <laughs> no. Otherwise, uh, yeah. Well, I'm just saying because you know, m my daughter needed an MRI, you know, or a CAT scan the other day, you know, just recently, and you know, they had to wait for, a, you know, to get it because she had a pain in 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 her um, in her back. So you know. But that pain could have been a blockage, could have been whatever. And to me, it's like, ugh, get the wait for the insurance. So I just uh, wanted no. to... Just I mean, you're still to... talking about what's basically an elective procedure, yeah. even though I know it's bothering the person, and who knows, it could turn yeah. out to be dangerous, yes right, or no. Right, right, right. But there's a big difference between an elective procedure or test and an emergency procedure. And yeah. stroke is always an emergency. And that's acknowledged by every insurance company and every Right, everything. so this is done through the ER when, you go, when they go in and... And they and they need a TPA. It's always done through the emergency department. And the wonderful thing is, and this is, you know, I have to give credit to the company that makes TPA because they recognized a long time ago that there are going to be people who come in. They look as if they have a stroke. You start getting the drug ready, which is a very expensive medication. It's six right. or seven thousand dollars for one dose. Oh my god! For one dose, oh which is what you get. So they recognized a long time ago, there are going to be people who come in, look as if they have a stroke, and uh, something happens along the way. And you suddenly realize, oops, it's not a stroke. Maybe the CAT scan tells you, but sometimes just your clinical judgment. Right. Or something else comes to light, like maybe they have a tendency to bleed or something like that, too dangerous to give it to them. Maybe the patient or the family change their mind, which sometimes happens. They say, oh, I just don't, I don't want to take a risk. There's always risks. Wow. The benefits way outweigh the risks, way outweigh the risks, but there's always a risk. Something happens and they, something happens so you can't treat them. The drug company a long time ago said, to their credit, we recognize that this could happen. We want the drug to be available for every stroke patient who needs it. Wow. So if you take that drug, mix it up, get it all ready, about to inject through the IV, give it to the patient, and something happens, you have to abort it, you stop. Right. Um, for most other drugs, the vast majority, the hospital would be charged yeah, yeah, $7,000. Yeah. The company for many years now has said, if you are unable to treat the patient because something unexpected happens, they reimburse the hospital. Wow. Wow. And that encourages all the clinicians, right. the yeah. nurses, the pharmacy and the administration of the hospital, don't be shy, right. don't be scared, don't worry about the financial implications for the hospital because who knows, you waste this, waste that, the hospital suddenly goes, in, you know, goes into a right. deficit. Right. Don't worry about it, they will get reimbursed by the wow. company and it always happens. That's incredible, and, um, yeah. that's incredible. Because that's pharma's that's got such a bad reputation, yeah. especially lately for all the bad things that are happening. But that's like something responsible that they've taken. Yes, really yes, wow. yes. Wow. It is in t it is incredibly responsible. And even if they're doing it just for good public relations, it's who perfect. cares? Yeah. Who cares what yeah. the motivation is? It is incredibly helpful to patients. Yeah. Um, it's saving lives. It is saving. It is saving lives. It's saving lives because you know what would happen yeah. if yeah. the hospital was reluctant. Yeah. Right. And they'd say. Don't mix up the drug until you're a hundred percent certain. Well, you're wasting then time. you're wasting time because it takes right. minutes and minutes to mix yeah. up the drug. Right. So you can start mixing the drug while you're talking to the patient. Right. It looks like a stroke, but you have to be sure. Get yeah. a little more detail. Yeah. What are they telling you? Do the neurological exam. Right. Look at the CAT scan carefully. Make sure there's no blood or anything else in there, etc. So it's it's fantastic. So you said before this is given through an IV. So the TPA is uh, given through an IV and it's given first, you just give kind of a shot of it through a syringe. That is the initial dose and it um, builds up the level quickly. And then it's given slowly as a drip through the IV over another hour. And that's it. So it goes in over so an it, hour. So it's breaking up the clot that is yes. in. And what's... what's I'm just curious, like, what is it? Um, I guess you wouldn't help, help to tell me what it's made of, but that's very interesting that kind of as it dissolves the clot. Yeah. Well, it's an excellent question because what is it made of? I'll tell you what it's made of. It is made of exactly the same substance 
that every single one of us have in our body, in our bloodstream. We all have something called tissue plasminogen activator, TPA, made by our bodies, circulating. Its job is to break down blood clots so that you don't suddenly have a blockage in your veins of your legs or you don't have a blockage here or there. It's our body's natural clot buster. The only thing is, when you get a big blood clot that goes to your brain and blocks off the blood supply, your body's own chemistry is not enough. It may break down that blood clot a week later, way too late. This is the same substance, exactly the same. Wow. It's been engineered basically, but it's mm-hmm. the same substance. Wow. So it's totally natural in and a it's sense. Safe. Yeah. So and it's not going to it, have side, of, not side effects because sometimes the medicines like chemo, you yes. know, chemo when chemo you're putting poison. it into your body, yeah, it's helping one thing, but it's hurting other, item, well, other organs in your body. Well, that's the other thing. And because it's natural, it's the same as your body produces you have no resist, you don't build up like antibodies to it. Mm -hmm. You give people other things, they can get it once, and then they have antibodies. They build up like an immune response to it. You can't give it to them again. TPA is a natural substance. You can, God forbid, someone has five strokes over 10 years, you could give it to them every single time. I didn't know that. Would that break up a clot, say like in your leg, or blood clots and like deep vein thrombosis? The answer is yes, although it's not typically used because there are other treatments for blood clots in the legs and blood clots elsewhere. Blood thinners, right? Blood thinners, Mm -hmm. but it is very similar to what was used for heart attacks for many, many years and Mm -hmm. is still used to some degree. But you know, for a heart attack now, if you have a something replaced, but it's the same drug that was used for heart attacks for 30 years and sometimes is still used. Mm -hmm. And it does work for heart attacks just as it does for stroke. Mm -hmm. There's one thing that I really wanna say just in case we get sidetracked not sidetrack, but go on to other <laughs> subjects, I really want to say, because we talk about TPA, the clot busting drug, and we talk about the four and a half hour window, but I want everyone to know that the latest miracle treatment is a little bit different. And say it, it to the camera so uh, that everybody could there is specifically. Another, there is another miracle treatment, there is, and it's for the worst types of strokes. It is for the types of strokes with the biggest clots that block off the largest blood vessels in the brain that cause the most devastating types of strokes. And you probably would have read about it. And um, it is basically a mechanical treatment for stroke, mechanical, Hmm. rather than drug related. And what it is, is going in with a catheter through the groin, the same way many people are familiar with if you have a cardiac catheterization, they wanna look at the blood vessels of the heart. Same idea, take a catheter, goes in through the groin, sometimes it can go through and through the arm also, goes up usually through the main arteries in the neck, the carotid arteries, for example. Right, The main arteries in the neck. And this is a catheter that goes up, right up into the head, where the major blockage is, and basically it goes in with like, for example, a stent. A stent is this kind of metal mesh Normally, in the heart, for example, this metal mesh just expands, goes like this. It expands, it opens up a blocked blood vessel, and it stays there. For a stroke, it's a little bit different. These special stents that are designed for strokes go up through the catheter, go right up into the clo- blocked blood vessel, open up the stent, it kind of crushes the clot, it does not stay there, it grabs hold you put like this. It can be done in 15 minutes, 20 minutes. It's almost wow. miraculous for the worst types of strokes. Wow. Five studies, five studies done all over the world showing the benefit of this kind of treatment for the worst types of strokes. It does not replace TPA. It can be done in conjunction with TPA. Wow. So if you come in with three hour, within three hours or you come in within four and a half hours, you get your TPA. We do special testing, get the CAT scan, do special testing to look at the blood vessels, which can be done also with CAT scan. You identify one of these major blockages, they're getting their TPA, you rush them over to the angiography suite for an angiogram. That's the more invasive test with the catheter up there. The TPA is doing its job, but you may have this enormous clot there that's very difficult to break down. Even with TPA, you pull it out. 
Wow. And that has resulted in miraculous, miraculous recoveries. Wow. Remember, these How are the worst kinds of How long have you been stuff. doing that for? That was pr about since 2015. Mm -hmm. I'll yes, tell you what, really. they were initially tested 2010, 11, 12, 13. The technology wasn't so great, not so great, or what the treatment. Right. By 2015, there were five positive studies each one all over the world done all wow. continents showing the same results miraculous recoveries in these horrible devastating strokes pulling out the clot they were all positive and that was six hours wow so that was a six hour window now that doesn't mean you wait till five and a half hours no. to come to the hospital yeah so that's the thing <laughs> that's the trap that people fall into right. whether it's patients families or even doctors right. until you get experience you have to remember just because it was tested up to six hours it seems to work up to six hours you don't wait because the longer you wait the more brain cells are dying you may still help yeah. the patient but right. you'll definitely help them more at four hours than you will at six That's and right. you'll help them more at two hours right. than you will at right. five right. so it doesn't matter it doesn't matter that you now have a six hour window it's effective up to then it's more effective if you treat earlier right that was 2015 and then lo and behold guess what Everybody said, is there any way we could stretch the window even further? And can we get away from a strict time window? It has, there has to be a way to say, I can't just look at the clock and say, you came in at six hours and three minutes, we can't help you. It doesn't make sense. Right, right. And it, everybody thought, everybody's brains are different. Everybody has a different amount of resiliency. You have a blockage, but some people can compensate a little bit more. Right. Some people's brains, areas of the brain are gonna be dead like this. Right. There's nothing you can do. Some right. people within a longer period of time are gonna have these other channels that bring some extra blood in. They're gonna save other areas of the brain. They right. can go a little longer. It had to be that we could get away from simply looking at the clock. I'm looking at the wall because I expect to see a clock there. There's no, there's no clock. There's a clock. I'm looking over there, looking at my wife at the same time, under the clock. But um, there had to be a way to say, what's wrong with this person's brain? Right. Not just did they come in at three hours, four and a half hours, six hours, or six hours and 10 minutes too late. Right. So what was developed using simple CAT scans was a way as soon as the patient comes in, you could do a special type of scan using a CAT scan that shows you the area of the brain that's kind of dead from the stroke. In other words, you can't reverse it. Everybody knows you have a stroke, there's always gonna be some area that you can't save. The key point of the new tests with a CAT scan is while you could see a small area maybe that's completely dead you can't save it you can also see a large area of the brain that's not getting enough blood supply it's at risk it's not functioning well the person may have a uh, complete paralysis of one side but that's because a large area of the brain is malfunctioning right it's on the verge of dying but it's not Right. It is still alive. Right. And if you can restore the blood supply to that patient with a small area that's, okay, you can't save it, we accept it. You can't save it. But they've got this huge area around it that if you, about which, if you don't do something, that will go on and become part of the stroke. Wow. And that small area will then exactly. enlarge into this huge area. And those are the patients who remain totally disabled because mm -hmm. they've gotten this major blockage in their brain. Now we have CAT scans that tell us that. So guess right. what? By 2017, another two studies, again, they're all scientifically well done studies, showed that if you do these special tests, identify a certain group of patients, small area of dead brain tissue, large area of salvageable brain tissue, right. Right. you can treat them up to 24 hours. Wow. wow. 24 hours, nobody ever thought this would ever happen all of us as stroke neurologists, I yes. tell you, we, yes. to us, to us, it's a miracle. Yeah. You could, now, I, now, I'm going to say it again, like a broken record for the listeners and viewers who know what a broken record was, nobody under the age of 40, <laughs> probably, but the broken record saying the same thing over and over, I have to say it again. Just because we now have a treatment that can save you in a way, up to 24 hours, doesn't mean you wait 19 and a half hours no. or no. 20 because 
You're still going to do worse if you wait. You're yes. still going to do better if you yes. come in at two yes. hours than if you come in at 22 hours. And you never, and, and, and nobody ever knows what the body's going to do. You really need to go for treatment no matter what. Yeah, and, and, and as soon as you find out that something is off, that something is going Use on. the basics that we yes. talked about before. Yes. Be fast. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Balance, eyes, face, twisted, okay. arms, lift up, see one droop. Yes. Speech, are they slurring their speech? Just trouble generating, they can't get the words out, yeah. or they're not making sense. Yeah. And then remember the T for time, because even though we've now stretched it to 24 hours, which is again a miracle, mm -hmm. and we can save people at 24 hours, don't wait 24 hours. Yeah. In fact, don't wait at all. Yeah. Call 911. Don't wait at all because the brain cells are still dying. You yeah. want to get there as quickly as possible. Yes. Yeah. Doctor, tell us a little bit about Ginny's story. Well, without getting into too many <laughs> personal details, um, you know, there was uh, Ginny's stroke was the kind of stroke due, due to a blockage um, with some symptoms that I think Ginny noticed and could probably tell you in more detail than I could. But there were the symptoms from a blockage in the brain. Um, we thought at first that it might have been due to some narrowing of a carotid artery. Um, remember, ultimately, this kind of stroke is always due to a blockage somewhere. Right. Now, it could either be a blockage in the artery itself from hardening of the arteries. The artery gets narrower and narrower and eventually can either close off or you can get a little clot or a little piece of cholesterol or something like that that breaks off, travels up to the brain, blocks off the blood supply. And that's why we need to always main, uh, go to the doctor and know our levels for, yes. for blood pressure, for uh, cholesterol, so that we could stay healthy. Yes, 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 and I'll, and I'll follow that up okay. in a minute, but just to finish with Ginny, yeah. I mean, there was some narrowing of the carotid artery. Um, it was actually not that severe. And it doesn't have to be that severe to cause a stroke, but you don't want it to get more severe. Right. So in Ginny's case, as Ginny can tell you, it seems like sort of ad nauseum, Ginny will come for a checkup year after year, doing 100% fine after the stroke from which she made an excellent recovery, basically complete recovery. But we monitor the carotid artery, which in Ginny's case was the problem, and we monitored it with ultrasound, no radiation, no needles, really non-invasive. The technology is wonderful. And you can look at the same carotid artery year after year after year and make sure that nothing is getting worse. Right. And hopefully if you do the right thing, it does not get worse. Right. If it were to get worse, then there are other treatments that then become a little bit more invasive again, but there are effective operations to clean out the carotid artery dramatically reduce the risk of stroke and more recently just as you have for the heart stents that you can put in less invasive right. go through an artery sort of like the procedure before put a stent in open it up same way they do in the heart and it again has a dramatic effect to decrease the chances of having another stroke Ginny never needed that she's taking care of herself did dancing, she have to go on blood thinners well there are various types blood thinner is able to use it it's not literally thinning out the blood but it's making the making it more slippery, you might say. Oh, so, so what about a low-dose aspirin? And a low-dose aspirin is absolutely fine, which is the baby aspirin, the baby 81 aspirin. milligrams of aspirin, which is what we usually use. Why? Is there a difference between a baby aspirin and an adult aspirin, or four aspirin a day? The answer is no. In terms of effectiveness, it's all virtually the same, but by taking a baby aspirin, it's a little gentler on your stomach, and that's one of the main side effects, as everybody knows. You take too much right. of it. Some people are more sensitive, some people less sensitive. You don't want to hurt your stomach. I mean, you want to prevent a stroke, but having a bleeding ulcer, no one's going to say thank you, and you're not doing the person any good either. Um, so you have to be a little bit careful. Even an aspirin, you know, it's not candy. It, in effect, is what you're saying. It's a blood thinning medication, but a gentle one. It makes the platelets, which is what clots, you know, the substance in the blood that makes you clot, makes them more slippery. Right. Plavix, well known to many people, does the same thing. Plavix <laughs> does the same thing. Right. Yeah. Um, a blood thinner, but gentle. Right. And then there are stronger blood, so-called blood thinners that most people are familiar with. The oldest one that's been around forever is Coumadin, mm -hmm. which is used for specific types of heart conditions that are a major contributor to stroke. 
and I'll just mention it because it is so common. It's an irregularity of the heartbeat called atrial fibrillation. Wow. Fibrillation, atrial fibrillation. As you get older, say beyond the age of 75, 80, atrial fibrillation, this heart condition, and irregular, irregular heart rate accounts for 30% of all strokes. Wow. One third of all strokes. Basically, it, uh, it promotes blood clot formation in the heart, breaks off from the heart, travels up to the brain, blocks off the blood supply. It's a major cause of devastating stroke, and it's a and it's and it's treatable. It's right. treatable right. by TPA. It's right. treatable, but it's treatable by blood, blood strong blood thinners like Coumadin, which is not the greatest drug in the world. Anybody who takes it will tell you that. You have to get blood tests all the time to make sure it's in the right yes. level. Everybody needs a different dose. You can't eat certain things. Um, it interacts with the diet. It interacts with all kinds of many other medications. Right. And finally, after years and years of that kind of nonsense, I mean, look, it did a great job and it prevents a lot of strokes, um, but it's not the most convenient drug in the world. And there is, of course, risk of bleeding with any blood thinning medication. They wanted, a, they wanted to put me on Coumadin at age 26 when I had a stroke. And oh. I, I didn't want to, I wouldn't take it. I wouldn't take it. I said, I'm too young okay. to start to take Coumadin. Over the years, it would, it would work against me. You know, I, I didn't want it, and um, and my neurologist okayed that I didn't that I didn't take it. Okay. Well, I I, it. I, the other thing is, in the past, Coumadin might have been used a little bit more loosely, you might say, mm -hmm. and now the rules for using Coumadin or related medications are really quite strict. We know that it works for certain conditions like atrial fibrillation amazingly well, but you're not going to just take the average person with a stroke, which could have multiple different causes for the blockage, but not atrial fibrillation, for example, and don't put them on Coumadin because right. it's not the right medication. Right. Right. And just on the positive side, Coumadin with all its inconveniences, we now have uh, several new clot, uh, blood thinning medications like Coumadin, which you've heard of, mm -hmm. Eliquis, yes. Pradoxa, yes. Zarelto. You'll see them advertised. Yeah. You'll also see all the lawyers' advertisements <laughs> with all the lawsuits. <laughs> but putting aside all the lawsuits and all the legal stuff, if you just look at the studies, just stick to the medicine and stick to the science, right. I can tell you that every single one of those new ones, Eliquis, Pradoxa, and Zarelto, have been tested against Coumadin for the prevention of stroke in people with atrial fibrillation. Right. Every single one of them is at least as effective, at least as effective, some a little bit more effective. Every one of them is safer in terms of less risk of bleeding in the brain as right. a complication, all of them, and they're all much more convenient. Wow. No blood work involved, mm -hmm. no interaction with diet, and if they interact with other medications, you're talking about an interaction with four or five other medicines instead of interacting with about a hundred other medicines. Right. So they're incredibly more convenient. There are these medicines, which again, I don't want to push any one of them. Right. I'm not affiliated with any of these drug companies at all, right. zero, but I can tell you they are now endorsed as a first line treatment by many professional organizations. They're effective and safer than Coumadin and they make your life much, much easier if you happen to have that particular yeah, condition. Yeah, I mean, I think that, that, you know, it's been 30 years since my stroke. So I, I just think there's the, the evolvement that has happened in the stroke world is just incredible. Um, you know, so, you know, when I suffered a stroke 30 years ago, you know, Coumadin was the only thing around, mm -hmm. you know, other than a baby aspirin, yeah. you know. So, it, 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 you know, I, I understand that the doctors had to do their work but I mean, I just knock on wood. I'm happy that nothing that I didn't take it, and that I'm still healthy. And I, you know, and the other thing is, we we always need to st stay with your doctor, which yes. that's what you do yeah. mm -hmm. with the doctor. Yep. You always visit. Every As a matter of fact, your visit year. is it's coming up uh, the beginning of the year, January. Yeah, I'll see yeah. You again. yeah. Well, so. I need the copays, so <laughs> keep, keep coming. Keep coming. <laughs> Uh, but what I found interesting, just very quickly, when um, I was doing the, having the Dopplers done, not only did they do, did you do the carotid arteries, but intracranial. I said, don't wear any makeup. Come in, I'm going, really, these people are going to see me with no makeup. But <laughs> through my eyeballs and the side of wow. my ear and up the back of my neck to have a better view of what's going on inside the brain. And that's absolutely correct. Yeah. And it's not done in all places, but yeah. in certain places. And we do it. 
you have to remember, while everybody thinks of the blood supply to the brain going up through the carotid arteries, which is a major supply, of course, to the mm -hmm. brain, those carotid arteries don't end at the neck. Yeah. They go into the head, they give off all the major branches, and then there are main blood vessels in the back of the neck. Right. They also don't end in the neck, they go up into the brain. Right. And using ultrasound, just like the carotid Doppler or sonogram, right. there's a special sonogram called a transcranial mm -hmm. Doppler through the head, transcranial, and it does the same thing, no radiation, no needles, and it's able to tell us whether there's any blockages in the major blood vessels of the brain. Which is important stuff yeah. to know, so you know yeah. what you're dealing with, and that was what, we'll bring it back to the beginning because we have to close okay. out, is what that what that, ex, um, that very well-known doctor had said to you, what is the cause of... Yes, what's wrong with Mr. What, Jones? Yeah. Yeah. We can't Mr. lump Jones. everyone into the same basket. Right. Everybody's different. First, get the diagnosis correct, right. and make sure you're dealing with stroke and not some other neurological condition. Okay. I hate what's going to help them the most. Which treatment? Are they there within three, four and a half hours? Give them the TPA. Are they there within three, four and a half hours or beyond it? They'll also qualify up to 24 hours now for these catheter-based treatments. Pull out the clot. Do they have atrial fibrillation? Treat them with one of the blood thinning medications. Do they have a sort of simpler type of stroke? Aspirin or Plavix is fine. Right. And just to let you know, and for everybody to know, we've come a long way. We've come a long way, baby. We've come a long but way, baby but we have a long way to go. Yes. Now we don't save yes. every single person and not every single person comes back to normal, a lot more than in the past. What are we about to start at LIJ at North Shore? We're gonna start doing in a couple of months, a study using stem cells. Because wow. oh. what's the holy grail of stroke? Yeah. We try to prevent it, we try to treat it, and once it's happened, what do we do? Give physical therapy, hope for the best, and people do get better. Wow. But imagine if we could scientifically show, and it's very scientific, it's not just this or that, using stem cells to help the brain regenerate, wow. actually heal, heal and brain. regenerate. Wow. That's the other kind of holy grail, what we all hope for after wow. stroke. Wow. So we're not stopping. We're looking at everything we possibly can to help people That's with stroke. That's very exciting. Um, I'm really upset that we have to close out, but we'd like to invite you back because you My really pleasure. do have a, a, an enormous amount of information and you're on the cutting edge of a lot of important things that are happening in the stroke world and um, well I just read about it this morning oh, right before I came here yeah, really? and that's why I remember it that's the la <laughs> see we're all, we're on the cutting it's edge here to have a sense of humor Yay! it's world. like cramming for an exam the night before <laughs> <laughs> hopefully uh, schedules will work out for the telethon next year probably yes. and then yeah. I know you had a big conference this year yeah so yeah. we'll have to see where those okay. are yeah that's gonna, gonna be okay. on May 3rd, May 3rd. Okay. okay we'll have to see yeah there's a, there is the American Academy of Neurology tends to have their conference that's around right, that time but We'll talk. We'll, see. we'll yeah. talk. We'll and get we'll them to change. No, you, no, yeah. you know, you know what we do in that situation is you come in. We'll do a segment, and we'll show that segment we'll on the air. Yeah. That's okay. what we do. So and then you can't can be here. Like you were yeah. worried about. Yeah. yeah. Say that or again. we can edit it. Got it. Oh, that's <laughs> nice. Or, or nice. you can Skype in from wherever you are. We we got everything here. So, Dr. Lieberman, okay. it's. A pleasure. It was a pleasure to meet you. Ginny, you're blessed. I'm really, yes. You're blessed. Yes. You're blessed yes. to Absolutely. have found somebody that's so passionate and really on the cutting edge and really makes a difference in, in the world. It's not only a job, it's a passion. It's somebody that I trust. Yes. Which is yes. Which the, the biggest step is trust. Yeah. She doesn't trust too many people. <laughs> <laughs> Herb, you want to come on in? Come on in. So, um, you want to come in, Dawn? No? <laughs> so, um, you know, we're really, I mean, this this show is really a show that you need to rewind and rewind and rewind because Dr. Libman really gave us a lot of information, a lot of important information and stats. And what I love is you not only gave um, the information, but you gave the, the behind the scenes and how it happened and, and the backing for what you're saying and what is... So that okay. is stock it up a little bit. <laughs> hold hold well, on to well, it. I can, I, I can tell you that when I was looking for a neurologist and I spoke to my internist and she said, I have two recommendations. She said, they're both pretty much equally qualified. One is really has no bedside manner. He's very abrupt. And the other one is really nice. I said, give me the nice guy. <laughs> you went to the wrong guy. <laughs> <laughs> but it's
it's good. It's good. And thank you. Thank you so My pleasure. much. My thank pleasure. you. We're really, um, it was a wonderful show. Judy, do, do you have anything you want to? Just remember to get help as soon as you can. Immediately. Don't put it off. Don't wait. Don't think it's going to get better. Mm -hmm. Time Absolutely. is of the essence. Yes. Your brain cells are dying. You must get help immediately. Yeah. Time is brain. And time time is brain, is brain yes. for a brain attack. Yes. Denial, and denial is not just a river in Egypt. <laughs> I like that. Her, did you want to say anything? Um, no, only that I'm glad I recognized what was going on yeah, with her yes. in enough time. Yeah. yeah. Very good. That's good. So, um, thank you so much. Uh, we have to roll on out because uh, Pam's show is uh, on and she's on her way to the studio, so we don't want to hold her up. And uh, thank you so much. We're off next week. It's Labor Day. We're going <laughs> to kind of take a, a, a summer hiatus and then we're back on the roll and we'll come back on uh, September. What's the date, Judy? September 8th. We have Dr. Roxanne Carfora yes, back. Yes, she's wonderful. She's yes. wonderful, Dr. Roxanne. So thank you so much. Let's blow our kisses. We blow our kisses. You ready? One, two, three. Mwah. Bye, everyone. <laughs> Bye. Thank you.
the conversation that all dead The lines cut off inside my head I left here like a broken man With no idea of where I stand